It's a joy to be back with you again. Thank the Lord for the privilege of preaching his word, which has been a blessing to me. The Lord said, freely ye have received, freely give. That's what we seek to do. I apologize for the change. I've asked permission to, to alter the message that I was going to give. So also the scripture reading uh, is changed from Psalm 126, which was written in the bulletin, to Psalm 27. If you'll please uh, turn with me to Psalm 27 for our first scripture reading. Psalm 27. And then I'll be reading from my text in 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning with verse 38. The first Psalm 27, written by David, King David, a Psalm of David, Psalm 27. <clears throat> the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, O Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not. Neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathed out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning with verse 38. 1 Samuel 17, I'll read from 38 to 51. <clears throat> and Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off from him, off him. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about, 
and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the burst beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee, and I will give thee the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass, when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. <clears throat> but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Let us pray. O Father in heaven, we depend upon thee. We thank thee, O Lord, that by thy grace our confidence is in thee. In the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in the victory that he has won over death and sin and hell and the grave, Father, and in his glorious resurrection and in thy almighty power and the promises of thy holy word, and Lord, we pray that thou wouldst continue to destroy the works of the devil. Lord, we pray that thou wouldst continue to fulfill that promise. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Lord, we pray that thou wouldst bless thy kingdom even at this hour and through this message. Father, we pray that thou wouldst build us up in our most holy faith. We pray also that thou wouldst work faith in the hearts of uh, where there is no faith, Lord, of the hearers, Lord, that you would touch souls and grant salvation through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and repentance unto life. Lord, we pray that you would build each of us that hear and listen, who know and love you, Lord, that we would walk with thee and that we would be strengthened to walk in confidence in thee and to live and serve thee every day of our lives. Uh, as we contemplate how you used your servant, how you worked in his life, and what our need is, Lord. We pray that thy Holy Spirit would meet our need according to your grace and your promises, and that as we pray, even for others, Lord, we may be strengthened and enabled to pray uh, in faith and in confidence in the fact that your Spirit, you work in us by your power to cause us to ask and you grant us even more abundantly above all that we ask or think according to your good grace and pleasure and wonderful um, plan. Lord, we ask your blessing as we meditate upon thy word and this history, this sacred history that you have given to us in the scriptures. In Jesus' holy name we pray. <clears throat> Amen. We have read the great and glorious story of David and his slaying of Goliath. It's a much-loved story, of course, just as so many of the psalms written by this great king of Israel, 
who passed through many trials before becoming king and even afterwards. Not a perfect man by any stretch of the imagination, but a man who loved the Lord, a man whose heart was after God, and a man who thirsted uh, after the living waters and whom the, use, the Lord used mightily, a, a type of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ even. A man who had confidence in the Lord and walked with the Lord and served the Lord and is in many ways a great example to us all. What was the secret? What was his secret? What was the secret that made David courageous? Here he was. Uh, you know, not really that young, but you see him putting on the armor of Saul. He must have been about 18 or 19, a little bit younger than Isaiah. Um, was about to turn 20 tomorrow. Um, a young man, but full of courage and confidence in the Lord. It was because he placed his confidence in God, not only in battle. It wasn't just as if in that moment all of a sudden he became courageous or confident in the Lord. But he had learned, as he matured as a young man, to trust in the Lord continually. To have confidence in the Lord continually, not just in battle. He depended upon God while he took care of his sheep, when he served God in his daily life. Listen to what he wrote in the Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? You see it everywhere in his, his writings, his confidence in the Lord, in God's grace and forgiveness. This confidence, and so the victory itself, belongs to those who learn to walk with God continually. And that's what I hope you'll remember. The victory belongs to those who learn to walk with God continually. We need to practice and learn to have our confidence not in ourselves or our ability or our strength or others or resources or anything else, but in the Lord and in His grace and in His Christ and in His cross and in His resurrection. In the Lord our God is our confidence. To accomplish anything, to realize anything, as the Lord Jesus said, without me ye can do nothing, but with God all things are possible. So this victory belongs to those who walk, learn to walk with God continually, and that needs to be our goal. So I want to draw some points to support this, and, 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 and uh, in the light of what we have here in the history before us, uh, briefly draw some various points for us to meditate upon. Firstly, as we began to read in, in verse 38 of how he tried on the, Saul, uh, the armor of Saul, yet he said, this, this is not proven, I must put it away. What has not been proven, what you haven't practiced with, with is of little use for the battle. What is not proven is of little use for the battle. So we need to learn to continually walk in confidence in the Lord, to continually put off the old man and put on the new man, to continually practice being hear, do, doers of the word and not hearers only. David said, I cannot go with these, for I have not proven them. Have, I've not proved them. Verses 38 and 39 say, And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail, and David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go. He, he felt like he couldn't go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. He did well not to use what he had not proven. In battle, one can well use those things to, one, to which one is accustomed. If you're used to using a certain weapon or something, uh, maybe uh, something in the kitchen, this particular machine that you know and, and love or you uh, use often for good purposes, then it's useful. In battle, one can well use those things to which one is accustomed. 
prior to our spiritual battle, and we have many spiritual battles, we must be well-tuned in the knowledge of our Lord and God and His Word. So therefore, we can't wait until the time of crisis or trouble to get into God's Word and to, to practice a regular prayer time and regular devotions and family worship and so on, or being at church uh, to hear the Word of God preached. These things are not just for times of trouble and crisis, but is something that we are to teach our children to do continually and to disciple them for that purpose and, and to have this in our lives, a continual dependence upon God and His Word and knowledge of God and closeness to Christ. When one becomes accustomed to walking with God and serving Him with confidence, fulfilling our duties, then we are ready for battle. As the Apostle Paul said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And we need to get used to how these weapons work, such as prayer, meditation on the Word of God. One cannot expect that he will be well on the day of battle if he isn't well with God in everyday life. So we need to practice this. In our marriages, we need to pray together. We need to read the Word together. And if we have children, we need to have family devotions. That's very, very important. Our confidence must be placed in God. David was faithful in his duties with what God had given him, and therefore he was prepared for that moment. With his confidence placed upon the Lord. Remember, his father had sent him just to check on how his brothers were doing. He wasn't even planning on this, but when he got there... The moment of crisis came, he saw what Goliath was doing, going out 40 days in a row and, and uh, defying the living God, and the Lord raised him up. He was faithful in his duties, and he had his confidence placed in his daily life prior to that time, as he watched the sheep and, and, and on the other things that he did, his duties... Uh, as Jesse's son, his confidence was placed upon the Lord and not in horses or helmets nor weapons. The most important thing for our fight is that we should be in communion with the Lord and not entangled with sin. We must be continually fighting the spiritual fight, fighting the good fight, as the Apostle Paul calls it, against sin and not suffer ourselves to be entangled in sin. As David put aside the armor of Saul, we must lay aside, as the book of Hebrews tells us, lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Second, I'd like to note that it is an error to underestimate the adversary. Sometimes there are many unknown circumstances. We see this in Goliath. No, he underestimated this little lad. We read um, in verse 42, And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. Sometimes there's many unknown circumstances which are either not perceived nor understood which favor an adversary. This underestimation always favors the people of God when they are right with him. Remember, Israel won battles and lost battles conquered cities when they were going into the promised land and other cities they could not conquer when there was sin in the camp, when they weren't right with the Lord. But when we are right with Him, this always favors the people of God. The unbelievers, the adversaries of the Christians, always underestimate the church because they're not believers. They don't take God into account or the true and living God. They don't recognize his sovereignty, 
his power and his ability to save all his children and servants. We look at the nations of the world. Jeremiah says, the Lord says, the nations are as a drop in the bucket. They're nothing. They seem powerful. The church seems uh, troubled with all sorts of difficulties and weak and small. But if the Lord is with us, one can chase a thousand. We must look to the Lord and take him to account. They do not. They don't recognize his sovereignty, his power, and his ability to save his children and his servants. Our enemies despise us like Goliath despised David. They take us lightly for many reasons. They look at appearances. Oh yes, we're weak in ourselves. And sometimes we do that too, like Peter, when he started to walk on the water. No, he began to sink. Why? Because he looked at the waves and the wind and the circumstances and took his eyes off of Jesus. So we tend to do that to ourselves as well, to, to think, oh, well, I'm so weak and uh, we're so weak and we can just only do so much and, and how could we possibly win the battle? But the Lord is our strength. His is the battle. We're weak in ourselves. We're tired, embattled, isolated, having few resources. But our confidence is in nothing, none of those things. Our confidence is in Christ and his victory and in the Lord and his power, in his word and his promises, that he will never leave us nor forsake us and that he will prosper his church. What seems impossible, God can do without any trouble at all. Neither do we always know how the Lord is going to deliver us. We know he will deliver us. We know he will be glorified. We know he will build the church. But many times we don't know how. And like I said, it seems impossible to us in some cases with the circumstances. But we've got to get our eyes off the circumstances and look to God and his truth. He uses his hidden wisdom and his perfect providence. It is a surprise, then, for the two sides, for Goliath and David, how the Lord would deliver, or rather, perhaps even more so than David, all the armies of Israel. You had the army of Israel on one side, the armies of the Philistines, and everything looked like it was on Goliath's side and the Philistines' side until this happened. Saul had no idea how he was going to be delivered. They sat there and they listened to this blasphemy day after day. But the Lord had a plan. For example, in Daniel chapter 3, you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were about to be thrown into the fire. They had no idea exactly how the Lord was going to live, deliver them. Maybe by death. Maybe in some other way. They said, nevertheless, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Those were the words they spoke to the great king. So they didn't know how the Lord was going to deliver them. It was a surprise when the king saw uh, one as the son of man walking in the fire with them. And then they came out of the fire. And the ones that had thrown them in were burned up. The deliverance, the manner of the deliverance may be a surprise and often is, but the victory is not a surprise because we know we have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we see it beforehand by faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Third, the unbelievers, that is the wicked, trust in their gods which are nothing. If you look at verse 43, and the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Well, their gods are nothing. Their curses are nothing against us. To the contrary, their curses provoke the almighty living God. He is a jealous God. He will act even provoked by the curses of the enemies of God. For they are but worms and ants and, and nothing in his sight. Their curses provoke him. Uh, for example, we see Herod, the king 
in Acts chapter 12, at the end of that chapter, speaking as though he were God. You could read it very quickly here. Uh, chapter 12, 21 to 23. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. This is the king that a few days earlier had James killed. He was ready to have Peter killed, but the angel delivered him. He spoke as though he were, were, were as though he was God. But all this is nothing before the true and living God. Fourth, our battle we fight in the name of the Lord. Never forget that. We are here living for Jesus. We are here living and serving in Christ's name. And God will glorify his Son. Our battle we fight in the name of the Lord. In verse 45, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Our cause is the glory of God, the only one true and living God. People hate the, 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 the proclamation of the church with all the relativism that exists and is popular in the world, when we say there's absolutely only one way. God has ordained, and his word is the truth. The inspired word of the infallible word of the living God. And they ridicule the truth. But we come in the name of the Lord, and our cause is the glory of God. As David asked in verse 29, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? To fight in the name of the Lord is to fight as his servants. What we do, what we ask for, as Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, that will I do. And that will my Father do, because God will be glorified in his Son. So to ask for things in his name is to ask things as his servants. And to fight in his name is to fight as his servants, to live and serve him as his servants. Our hope is not in ourselves, but rather in him, in his holy name, above all names, in his power, in his attributes, in his righteousness, in his sovereignty. We are identified with him, so we live and serve in his name. The victory will come from him because he will defend his own holy name. He will prosper his people. He will bless his church. For this reason, David had confidence and did not focus on other circumstances. Just as we mentioned uh, a moment ago, Peter began to focus on other circumstances. He got his eyes off of Christ. Well, David was very single-eyed, right? He was confident in God and not focusing on all these circumstances that were contrary to him, this gigantic man in front of him and all his different, the speeches of Goliath and so on. He did not focus on other circumstances. He focused on God and his confidence and dependence were upon the Lord. Verse 47, And all this assembly... He continued with his speech, saying, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hands. So we see that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. All war is from him. Every battle, every trial, every difficulty we have uh, is ordained by him. And, and as Peter says in another place, the trial of our faith is more precious than gold. 
All war is from him. It proceeds from him. Thinking now of the broader spectrum of all history and uh, all the nations and even this situation between the Philistines and Israel. He lifts up enemies. That is God. He prospers sinners to fulfill his will. Remember the man in uh, writing Asaph in Psalm... Well, I'm not sure if it was Asaph, but uh, the, the, the writer of Psalm 73. He didn't understand why the sinners were prospering. But then he came into the sanctuary, the holy place, where he meditated upon the word of God, and he saw the sinners are in slippery places. The Lord prospers sinners to fulfill his will. Who crucified Christ? It was sinners that crucified Christ. And yet, God had ordained that for the salvation of our souls. He is sovereign over every trial, every difficulty, every persecution, every problem. All that we have going on in the United States, in this great country, and in the world right now, God is sovereign over it, and he is judging all the world. Remember what he did, for example, in raising up Babylon to punish his own people. Judah. Earlier, he raised up Assyria to be an enemy and punish or chastise the northern kingdom, Israel, Ephraim. And to, he used Babylon and Assyria to chastise and destroy and judge many other nations as well. God is the one who judges all the world and guides all history. And the result of war is from him. It's never to the strong or the mighty simply because they're strong or mighty. God has the result planned of every battle and every war aforetime. God judges and works in all for the good of his people and for his own glory. The battle is the Lord's. Sixthly, we cannot trust in weapons. This is an example of many things, as we mentioned earlier. It is an error and a sin to trust in weapons or to trust in our resources or in our own abilities, our own talents or experience. We cannot trust in these things. Our confidence must be rather in God, the true and living God, in Christ and in the grace of God. We don't deserve the victory. We don't deserve anything. What we deserve is hell for our sins. But the Lord Jesus Christ sent our Savior, I mean, uh, his Father sent our Lord Jesus Christ. The living God came in him, and he shed his blood and won the victory on the cross so that we could be shown grace and salvation and be delivered and blessed forever. The victory of the gospel is a gift. It's a free gift that we do not deserve according to the election of grace and God's eternal mercies. So our trust is not in anything about ourselves but in the grace of God and also for the battle, for sanctification, for holiness and daily living and to be able to pers persevere as a Christian and to be able to reach others with the gospel and serve God on a daily basis faithfully our confidence must be in the Lord, not in our own abilities. Seventh, beginning in verse 48, uh, we read about the victory over Goliath. We already read it, so I won't read it right this moment. But we all know the story. It was the Lord that guided that stone and prospered the stone that David threw. He could have done it otherwise. David grabbed five stones. Perhaps the Lord would have used the fifth one. But the Lord chose to use that first stone, and he prospered the stone that David threw. What we need is to have God prosper us in our works, in our battles, as we fulfill our duties. Wait upon him to prosper his work. So we must be men and women of prayer. We must learn to pray always, to pray without ceasing, as the Apostle calls upon us to do. David had served God in his duties as a pastor of sheep, a shepherd. In verse 37, he 
relates to Saul, this experience that he had. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Surely David had practiced much with the sling and stones. Thus God had prepared him. But it did not go well with him only for that. It wasn't simply because of his practice. And we would be sinning if we didn't practice on getting better at things that we need to do. Surely he practiced much, but that's not why the Lord blessed him. The Lord prospered his servant, and the Lord took the life of Goliath in that moment. So we cannot trust in weapons. We must be confident in God. Eighth, or eight, we must be brave like David. Where does that courage come from that David had? It came from the Lord. We must be brave in testimony and courageous for the fulfillment of the will of God. Attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God, as the great missionary William Carey uh, said. <clears throat> we should be courageous seeking for conformity, more conformity to God in our lives. We pray, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, or in earth, as it is in heaven. What we seek in prayer and ask God for, we should be willing to work for, to, to look for, to seek in all the earth. We want his kingdom to come, we want his will to be done, let us put his will into practice with faith in him in our own lives, uh, and seek that others too would repent and serve the Lord. Showing them that the way is through faith in Jesus Christ, the only way. Ninth, and last, the giant dead, we see, we read in verse 51 at the end, and when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. The giant dead, the Philistines fled. The unbelievers are cowards because they do not have an invincible giant. We have an invincible giant, the Lord, the only true and living God. They do not believe in the living God. They lack faith, and I'm not saying that they're not believers in some sense. There are a lot of unbelievers that have a lot of different types of faith, but their faith does not have the solid basis that our faith has. We believe the word of God. We believe in the only true and living God. We believe in the one that has all power in heaven and in earth. The Lord Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead, is our God and Savior. And so our faith has a solid basis in all of Scripture, which is the word that, shows us, uh, that, that reveals to us the redemption of Christ and reveals to us God in his character and in his triune nature as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and reveals to us the plan of God that he is fulfilling throughout history. They, the unbelievers, lack faith which has a solid basis or ground. On the other hand, our giant is invincible. The champions and the hopes, the machinations of the unbelievers will fail. They shall be overcome by God without any trouble on his part, and then, without faith, like the Philistines, they shall flee and be in shambles. That's what's going to happen to the unbelievers. One day, they will cry for the rocks to fall upon them. This is what Revelation tells us. Their faith rests upon lies, such as evolution, as the inventions of men, false and lying science, money, work, individuals, or people, medicine, government, their own ability or their arms. Their faith is in all these different things. Now we know the Lord can use these things and does use medicine. He does use uh, governments. He uses uh, money and work and so on. But our confidence is not in any of those things. And it cannot be. We must work. We must be diligent. We must seek to do all things to the glory of God in all aspects of our life, 
our lives. But through it all, we must depend upon God. We must be upon our knees. If we have to stand, we should be on our knees spiritually, praying even as we stand. Our confidence is not in any of these things or our abilities like with the unbelievers, with those that don't trust in the Lord. They have confidence in their own resources and their own ability. And when all these things or whatever giant in which they are trusting is conquered, they flee. On the other hand, the scripture says, the meek shall inherit the earth. Those of us who by grace submit to the true and living God, submit to his word, follow our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall inherit the earth. The servants of Christ, the church, shall be prospered all, always. And here on the earth, the church of Christ will continue advancing, even with the many trials and tribulations and difficulties that we have, persecutions, yet the church of Christ will continue advancing. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Christ will build his church. He shall protect her and he shall prosper her. And then all shall ask after the name of our Savior. We didn't read the end of the chapter. But after this happened, the military man, Saul himself, began to ask, Who is this David? Where did he come from? Who's his father? Well, when the Lord prospers his church, everyone will then look for the name of our Savior and our Deliverer, our God. Let us then be brave. Let us trust only in our Lord, in the grace that God has provided for us through Jesus Christ. He is our invincible giant. Let us be faithful in our daily lives. Let's seek to have this practice of confidence in God, which is best expressed as we learn to pray about everything and practice prayer. Let us be faithful in our daily lives, putting the word of God into practice, and let us fight for the right, for righteousness, proclaiming the gospel and calling to repentance in the name of our Lord Jesus. Let us learn this lesson that we have so exemplified in the life of David, God's servant, and seek after a, a closer walk with God continually. Learn to walk with God, walk with Christ our Lord continually. Let us pray. O Heavenly Father, we thank thee and praise thee for thy holy word. Thank you for preserving this history and so, much, uh, so many other events in the history of thy people that are written for our edification, for our comfort, for our strengthening, for our learning. We praise thee for the Old Testament and the New Testament. We praise thee for all that is written, all thy holy word given to us, so that these things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children. Lord, we know the secret things belong unto thee, but those which are revealed belong unto us and to our children, are, are our strength, for we trust in your word. Your holy and perfect and absolutely true and faithful promises. The word of the living God. Father, we thank you for it. Thank you that through it, you have caused us to trust in your holy name. You've caused us and brought us to, to rest under, the, under thy wings. And you've taken us under your arms. You are our good shepherd. O oh Lord, we praise you and thank you for our, our Lord Jesus Christ and his perfect shed blood for the remission of sins and his glorious resurrection and that he is exalted at your right hand, coming again. Lord, help us to live for thee continually in confidence in your grace, in your power, and in your hearing and answering us and, and blessing us through his holy name and for his sake. We pray that he may be glorified in the church and in all this world that thy will be done, that thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen.